at least 15 passengers and crew dead, perhaps 150 injured. That's the toll of the Pan Am jetliner hijacking in Pakistan. Nothing can justify such barbarism. We can think of no punishment too severe for the criminals responsible. We are confident that those who perpetrated this brutal act will be brought to justice. Good evening, I'm Ted Koppel and this is Nightline. Did you see any people killed or injured? Sure. We'll go to Pakistan to talk with survivors of the hijacked disaster. We'll also talk with a man who, until recently, was in charge of the Pentagon's counter-terrorism program. With one of Israel's top experts on terrorism, and with Libya's ambassador to the United Nations. This is an expanded edition of ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. It is a trite observation, but it is also true. The hijacking ended as quickly as it began. But the ending was even more violent and far bloodier than the beginning. The wounded are scattered about in different hospitals in Karachi tonight, so there is still no precise count. But it may well be that of the 400 people who were aboard Pan American Flight 73, a third or even more will have been killed or wounded when the count is complete. Now is the time to begin standing back to separate fact from unconfirmed rumor. Tonight, we can begin listening to the stories of those who were there in the plane, one of them in the cockpit with the hijackers. We'll hear from them in a few minutes. By this afternoon, our producers, camera teams, and correspondents finally reached Karachi. Among them, Mark Litke. Pan Am Flight 73 sits on the tarmac at Karachi International Airport, barely a sign of the horrible events that occurred only hours before. But a few miles away at Jinnah Hospital, the full extent of the carnage is clearly apparent. The dead, both young and old, laid out in a temporary morgue. Here, too, dozens of the wounded who survived, many still confused, unsure of all that had happened. But a few were able to tell us the tragic sequence of events, which began at 6.30 in the morning. They were just reboarding the flight. The boarding process was almost complete. Then, four to six uniformed men jumped on board. At first, passengers thought they were security agents. Uh, at once, one man uh, with a... Uh, uh, you understand? Yeah, machine gun. Machine with, uh, like a policeman, like a Pakistan policeman. Yeah. And uh, a hat. Had, uh, come on, come up in the plane, and uh, all people saw. Speaking Arabic, fluent Arabic, broken English. So they come up with the guns, hand, hand grenades, bombs, and everything in hand. Few words they were saying, everybody hands up, keep your head down. All of them, if you move, you'll be killed, you'll be dead. Passengers said they were then herded to the center of the plane. The hijackers, angry and apparently uncertain what to do what when they found out like? the pilot, co-pilot and engineer had escaped. Well, uh, they were kind of confused, but they were talking to each other, they were calling each other's name, and uh, they were like kind of confused too, but they were taking rounds and you know, coming back and forth. Doesn't want to let anybody go, you know, to the restroom for about six hours. They didn't let, let anybody go. Then, without warning, near 10 p.m., the power suddenly went out. The plane was thrown into darkness. The horrible ending was about to begin. After the power goes down, they just, after, they waited about 20 minutes or half an hour, I think. And after that, they just uh, pulled everybody together, you know, move uh, up uh, in the aisles, and then they start shooting. When all uh, was very dark, and the old people down and uh, in seats, hmm, they... Uh, they started shooting. Yes. After one, two minutes, uh, open uh, emergency door, and the old people jump out. We had old people, we had young kids, and elderly people, uh, youngsters, male, females, all of them were there. It turns out that Pakistani commandos were actually storming the plane at the same time the panicked passengers were rushing through the emergency doors. In the confusion, however, no one was really certain who was shooting whom. Throughout the night, Pakistani emergency services were pushed to the limit trying to deal with the dead and wounded. 
An American embassy official wandered through the corridors of this hospital, not sure how many Americans had been caught up in the massacre. How many Americans have you confirmed so far? You can't confirm that yet, does In the end, the comment of one doctor in this morgue just about summed up the day's tragic events. With all this, he said, it's hard to believe anyone survived. It's Saturday morning now here in Karachi, and the situation is still horribly confused 24 hours after this hijacking began. The dead and the wounded are scattered in several hospitals here in the Pakistani capital. The survivors are scattered around several hotels, and authorities are still closeted with two of the surviving hijackers trying to get some information out of them. It still may be hours, if not days, before authorities are able to piece together just exactly what happened here. Ted? Mark Litke, thank you. We'll be talking live with some of the survivors of the hijacked jetliner in just a few moments. But first, what is it that led to all this violence? Here is Nightline correspondent Jed Duval. And their uh, demand is that they like to go to Cyprus, land at Larnica, I believe, uh, where uh, they say they have some friends who are in prison and their aim is to get them out of the prison. If there is a beginning to the events in Karachi, it may well be here in Cyprus in late September of last year. Three Israelis are murdered aboard a yacht tied up at a marina. Three pro-Palestinian guerrillas are arrested, convicted and jailed. October 1st, 1985. Israel retaliates by bombing PLO headquarters in Tunis. Six days after that, pro-Palestinians hijack the cruise ship Achille Lauro. A man in a wheelchair, Leon Klinghoffer of New York, is murdered and thrown overboard. In April of this year, the U.S. raids Libya, and a quiet summer follows. The trio in Cyprus remains in jail, and though the connection is not certain, during this quiet summer, the planning for Karachi has begun. Two days ago, Libya's Qaddafi appears at Zimbabwe at the meeting of the so-called non-aligned nations. He promises to lead armies of liberation against U.S. imperialism. Is he part of what is about to happen in Pakistan, or is the connection merely spiritual, like minds bound by hatred for America? It is late evening in the United States, dawn in Karachi, when the incident begins. We just got word from the Associated Press of a hijacking tonight in Karachi, Pakistan. A Pan Am 747, it was Flight 73, with 390 passengers on board, and it was uh, bound for New York. It was on the ground and was taken over by uniformed men who fired shots in the air and then stormed the plane. Through the night, information is limited, often wrong. The passenger count now stands at 284. There were 14, 13 flight attendants on board as well. Now, you say that the, the crew jumped out, of the, jumped out of the windows of their cockpit? Yes, of the cockpit. They jumped out of the, uh, from the windows of the cockpit because they sensed that uh, three armed men are firing uh, at, the, uh, at other people uh, uh, down the plane. Now, Mr. Khan, we're talking about a, a jumbo jet. It is very high up from the cockpit yes, down to... Yes, very high up, but the roof was also there. America wakes up to the bad news Friday morning. A 29-year-old Californian is killed, his body dropped from the plane. The Pan Am flight crew had escaped early on through a hatch in the ceiling of the cockpit. Pakistani authorities had put fire engines and other vehicles around the plane, so it is surrounded, has no pilots, and is going nowhere. And while some of the passengers were getting on board this aircraft from here, uh, some hijackers took uh, hold of the aircraft. There are four of them. The hijackers, at this point it's still thought there are four of them, later a fifth is discovered, want a new flight crew, including someone who speaks Arabic. Pan Am makes plans to comply. The gunmen want to fly to Cyprus. One of them guards the cockpit, the others the doors. All are carrying many weapons, pistols and machine guns. I have asked Pan Am to provide the crew to take them away on the condition that all the passengers will be released. Through the day, Cyprus flatly refuses landing permission. Libya announces that its government had nothing to do with the hijacking. Secretary of State George Shultz is at Harvard and says this. 
This morning, our prayers and our all-out efforts go to the hostages on Pan Am Flight 73. Clearly, the day has not yet arrived when terrorism has taken its place among other vanquished barbarisms of our time. But that day will come, and when it does, history will show that American resolve, backed up by our power, tipped the balance in favor of peace and security. Schultz breaks off his Harvard trip and heads for Washington. The U.S. Navy says the carrier Forrestal and accompanying vessels are breaking off a visit to Naples to head for the seas around Cyprus. In Washington at midday, the State Department says what it can, which is little. Our paramount concern at this time is the safety of the passengers. We do not want to be in the position of possibly providing the terrorists, the hijackers, with information they do not already possess. As the State Department spokesman is finishing, events in Karachi are about to explode. The plane has been sitting for nearly 17 hours. The motor that runs the generator for the 747's internal power has not been refueled. It is about to run out of gas. When it does, the climax comes. Eyewitnesses on the plane tell us that all suddenly went dark inside the plane. At that point, the hijackers herded the, all of the passengers together in the rear of the plane, and the terrorists began firing at them point blank with automatic weapons. This firing went on for 30 to 60 seconds. At some point, the doors blasted open on the plane, and the passengers fled through these doors and ran towards the terminal. The pandemonium is followed by hours of confusion. There are, says one reporter, a hundred dead. No, comes another report, six dead. A hundred wounded. Twenty-six ambulances do go to the plane. Scores of men and women and children are taken to several different hospitals. Two gunmen are killed, two wounded and captured. That fifth hijacker turns up unconscious and is held. In the United States, the Secretary of Defense speaks at mid-afternoon. The uh, uh, incident in Pakistan is over. The Pakistans are in charge of the plane. The four hijackers are in custody. Uh, the uh, uh, final evacuation of the plane is underway. There have been casualties, perhaps several. Uh, there has been a lot of shooting. Uh, but uh, the situation is, uh, is indeed, uh, indeed confused, but uh, uh, we believe that it is, uh, it is complete now. A bit later, the U.S. government lauds the Pakistani action. The government of Pakistan acted boldly and decisively, and we applaud its exemplary resolve in doing so. But Pan Am is not so praiseworthy of Pakistan. The airline's chief operating officer blames airport security, not his own. We have a very strong security system in place in Karachi. Uh, one of the strongest in our system, in fact. The failure here was the uh, failure of the airport security system. The airport perimeter was penetrated by these terrorists in a very clever way at a very convenient time. The responsibility for guarding the airport perimeter is the airport authority. Late in the day at the Western White House, reporters are assured the president has been kept up to date. The president and the first lady expressed their condolences to the families of those killed and pray for the speedy recovery of those injured. We look forward to the safe and speedy reunion of the passengers with their families and loved ones. There may be some blame fixing. Governments may decide on actions or reactions. There will be an attempt to figure out who plotted the tragedy. But for now, for this moment, the story is the people, the innocent travelers, some shocked beyond expression, and those who, in the dark, made the doors fly open and grieving friends and families of those killed, and the people saved by some action, some heroism, or some chance, or some miracle. Jed Duval for Nightline. When we come back, we'll go live to Pakistan to talk with two survivors of the hijacking, an American who in fact did kick out a door and led other passengers to safety, and a Briton who thought his name was